Uh, good evening or good morning to everyone and welcome to this third day of this webinar series about shear wall modeling <clears throat> in OpenSeas and SDKO. So I will start sharing my screen just to show you uh, what we will be doing today. <clears throat> Uh, not this one, here. Um, so just a brief recap. Uh, this is the third day. In the first day, we have seen how you can do shell models. Uh, in that example, we have been using the plain stress user material for concrete, and the rebars were modeled are, as smear layers. So basically, I've shown you how you can use uniaxial materials how you can convert them into plain stress materials based on an angle, and how you can put them into a layer shell. Um, basically, this one is a way of smearing the rebars inside the, inside the surface of the shell. Then in the second day, we have seen, which is basically this one, okay? In the second day, we have seen how you can do it with a, a three-dimensional finite element model using continuum elements. Um, a three-dimensional uh, plastic damage model for concrete. And then I've, I've shown you an additional uh, way you have to model rebars. So instead of putting them as smeared layers, you can actually model directly the rebars as fiber sections, as beam actually. And then uh, we recently have implemented the ASD embedded node element. Here you have a link, which is basically a constraint that uh, tries to embed a node into a surrounding element. So it is a way to embed a physical river inside a solid domain. And then today we have this new, um, this new tool, which is um, the cyclic trust model. And here we have as a special guest, Professor Jose Restrepo uh, with, with this um, research group developed this, uh, this modeling approach. And he will give a short presentation about the theory, about the work that they are doing uh, about this model. And then I will show you part of it, because actually this is still a work in progress on our side of STKO. We have implemented only the two-dimensional version, which is enough now to show you how, how it works. And soon we will implementing the beam trust model, which is the three-dimensional version, um, in such a way that we can use this tool in uh, real life applications. Um, so, first of all, I will give uh, Professor uh, Celestrepo um, the scene so he can present, and then I will show you a simple example using the two-dimensional cyclic trust model. So, I stop sharing my screen, and please, Professor Restrepo, you can go ahead. Stage is yours. Good morning, uh, Massimo. Thank you very much for, for your invitation. And uh, Guido, uh, good evening to you all. I, I see I have a few friends um, attending this uh, webinar. So um, I'm going to give you here is uh, a little bit into the BIM uh, trust model, which is, is uh, one step further from the um, uh, original nonlinear trust model that we developed back uh, some 15 years ago. And I'm going to show you uh, two applications of, of this um, uh, methodology, talk about the advantages and disadvantages, and a little bit about the theory. And hopefully I can rejoin you again for the questions and answers um, in September. I'm a professor in structural engineering at the University of California, San Diego and have been working um, mainly as an experimentalist uh, associated with the large shaking table that uh, as a group I led and built uh, back in 2004 and have a strong collaborations with colleagues here, um, Professor uh, Joel Conte, uh, Professors uh, Yanis Cuatromanos at Virginia Tech, Mario Spanagiotto and other students I have had. So, uh, most of the work here is done in collaboration with um, uh, various um, researchers around the world, in fact. So what is, where does it come from, all these things of, of a trust model? Well, since the very incipient days, since the advent of uh, reinforced concrete, 
as we know it today, people were thinking that when they saw the cracking pattern, well, they say it works mainly like a truss. The cracks are inclined and somewhat um, they seem to have similarities with a crack. So it goes from the from from beam behavior initially before it cracks into um, a truss like um, structure after cracking because it needs to carry um, the shear. So we see the work of Ritter in Switzerland in very uh, a long time ago, 1899, then the merge in 1912 again, how to detail the uh, um, a reinforced concrete element. So it actually works as, um, as a truss. And then uh, if we go back in uh, 1979, uh, Tom Polly at the University of Canterbury was explaining uh, the um, um, shear flow in, in beam column joints um, with truss elements. He says the best way to understand this is not to understand that a beam column joint needs to be confined, because confined was a magical word, word for everything. But it, ha it had to sustain um, um, uh, a shear flow, and the best way to, to do this was using a truss. And that led to uh, recommend, design recommendations in the New Zealand code that were uptaken by the European code for the design of these elements. But these, these truss elements actually now in, in this is ex the previous slide is explaining the behavior. Is, is concrete cracks in, in, in diagonal, it needs to carry some forces or so as it loses a strength in tension. And, and the best way to do this was basically working with truss models that led to strata and time modeling and so on. But it's very interesting from the point of view now, not only of behavior, but of analysis, is the back in the 1940s, uh, Renikov in, in, in Canada, was trying to solve complex problems of um, uh, continuum mechanics that it says it's impossible to solve the differential equation. And basically came up with a very simple formulation of what we call a finite element today. And using finite differences, he postulated that a continuum can be resolved in a series of truss elements. He called them um, uh, frame, um, frameworks, framework methods. And he solved by cylindrical shells and all kinds of interesting problems. Of course, in, in those days, 1941, we can only think about linear behavior. The problem was ultra complex then. But this comes from the area of mechanical engineering. So um, quite an interesting thing. And, and uh, he postulated and solved uh, quite a few um, exercises with that. So this. This is a kind of lattice models that uh, will simplify the computational effort for, for a continuum or so. It's just very applicable to reinforced concrete in the sense that uh, we can also use uh, a lattice model or a truss model, and then we can assign, um, go into the nonlinear range and assign um, a stress strain properties for the elements. So here you go. This is a test uh, we did back in, in 2006, 2007 with um, uh, Dr. Mario Spanagiotto. We have tested a, a full scale um, a structural wall. In this case, this is phase two. So you can see here the web of the wall and you can see in white the flange of the wall. This front wall here, it's only to give torsional stability and it was to completely um, pin pin from the main structure, so it will not shear any um, uh, lateral forces. Only provide the torsional stability to to the structure. So, when we look at the cracking pattern of this, once we subject this to um, input ground motion, and we go to let's not even go to the plastic hinge. Let's go one level up, and we see the cracks in the web. I just um, highlighted them this morning. Unfortunately, the photos were in low resolution, but I basically retraced the cracks uh, for this presentation. And you can see the cracks that it's developing are mainly diagonal cracks in both directions. Those are the residual cracks that were um, observed after testing the um, structural wall. 
And you can see also in the flange, even though this, this structure has been subjected only to one, one direction, uh, one axis of ground motion, you can see that the flange as well sees some diagonal cracks because there is a shear lag. It, it's, it's no way, we cannot pretend that we have plane sections and therefore the strains at the edges of the wall are going to be the same as in the uh, web itself. The, the, the dashed lines here are the projection of the web um, on the flange wall there. And you can see some diagonal cracks, but there is, as soon as you um, open cracks, initially horizontal, you can see you need a sheer um, uh, a di diagonal compression field to transfer those stresses back into the web wall. So what are the main advantages of these nonlinear truss models? Namely the truss model per se that, uh, that Massimo will explain or the beam truss model, the computational efficiency. They, they sit, they, they, these nonlinear models sit between the, the uh, um, heavy computational um, um, plasticity continuum models and the very elementary lamp plasticity or, um, or fiber molds like um, modeling or so. So they, they sit somewhere in the middle and they have advantages and they have disadvantages. They, no, no world is perfect. There will never be the perfect element or model and there is a cost to it anyhow. So why are we looking for this? So we're looking at computational efficiency. Can we really, are we able to model a full building system today with um, high fidelity um, um, plasticity models or so? Yes, we can, and we have done that too. too. Uh, but it takes a lot of time and the effort. And when you look at convergency and you can have months and months and months before you get some results that makes any sense. So for research, you can afford that. For uh, practice, maybe not. Uh, you may be struggling to uh, have uh, results in the time you need them. So these elements, these truss elements are actually pretty efficient. They run uh, reasonably fast and they can provide you some answers. So they are designed, the, the main point here, they are not like any element, they are designed for something. It's, it, it, they are designed to capture the degradation and the strength of an element or of a system, building system or so. Um, they do not have any kinematic constraints. They are more like a quadrilateral or so. And, and enables the, the method to be used in walls with perforations or walls with uh, various cross-section geometries, uh, C-shaped walls, Z-shaped walls, uh, flange walls, all kinds of things and with or without perforations. Um, which is what we often find in practice. So mainly plain stress elements or so. Um, and that's what the target is. Now, one of the things you, you, you of course, you have to see the limitations is that you, we, we are going to have some overlapping um, uh, struts or, or concrete elements and say, well, that's, is that going to really affect? Is, is a bad news that you're, we are overlapping elements? And yes, of course, but it's mainly affecting the initial stiffness. And if we are going to do a nonlinear analysis to look for failure patterns or so, we will know that there is an initial stiffening effect. And for that reason, in parallel, very often we develop a linear model. So you don't want to necessarily do and rely on a model analysis using um, these methods because you're going to have a, a initial, um, the initial uh, high initial stiffness. But as soon as you get cracking, and then once you go beyond cracking, of course, now we are going to be in the territory where these elements are actually pretty efficient. There is significant literature available these days of the order of 15 papers by various authors that are uh, using the um, nonlinear truss element uh, or the beam truss element. And some other people have, back in 2000 and in the early 2000, other researchers were working on similar 
um, methodologies and they wrote some interesting papers. I can, I can recall Professor Sri Taran and Ingham and as well as Professor Mander were working with similar elements as well, even nonlinear elements or so. But we, here we were able to uh, uh, connect all the elements together and put um, some interesting um, coupling that you will see. So now if we move into the beam truss modeling approach, it's mainly the, 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 a family of non trust uh, of nonlinear truss elements, and we are just going to place out of plane elements. So the, 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 the nonlinear truss element per se is a 2D um, um, approach. Here is a 3D and you can have out of plane uh, stiffness. And in some cases, if you want to increase the degree of complexity, you can make, the, we, you can layer the, the elements as well and uh, evaluate the strength in the out of plane. And I will show you an example on, on, on this as well. So um, in, for the structural walls, we use a nonlinear fiber section, a section beam column elements. So in and out plane behavior, linear beam column elements um, if with, with zero stiffness and zero in plane flexural stiffness in the transverse direction of the wall and no linear thrust elements in the in-plane behavior to represent the concrete and the reinforcing steel. And for the slabs, we use something similar. Why are we worried about modeling slabs? Um, one would say, why we don't use a, a, a linear shell element? And, and you will see an explanation for that. In, in buildings that are, uh, let me say, um, typical buildings in Chile, or in many parts of the world that you are use a, a dense array of structural walls, they usually have an, a central corridor like a spine. And the slab, the, that corridor, that slab that can be six to eight inches thick can be subjected to significant um, um, uh, out of plane bending and form yield lines. You, those yield lines actually have a significant contribution in the response of a building. So we implemented this uh, to assess the development and propagation of the lines across the structure. And I will show you an example of it uh, later on. Well, actually pretty much uh, now. So this is uh, again now extending these to flange elements and by using, by using the, the truss or the beam truss element, we can now look at the um, at, at the flange behavior or so that I show you that you, you cannot impose a, a, a kinematic constraint and therefore you can account for the shear lag that you will have in a flange of a structural wall. In this case, if loaded in the, in, in, in the along B to D uh, here. In reality, in a building um, system, uh, if you have such a wall, it will be loaded in just about every direction, and then your model is able to capture this. One of the questions is, okay, how do we obtain these um, effective yeah, widths? Yeah, um, those effective widths, you can see them in papers. I'm, I'm not going to go into the complete theory of how to develop it here. There are papers that the Luan Panagiotto um, have a report in, in peer that shows how to uh, obtain the, the, the width of the elements, as well as the angle. In the angle, you may have to do some iterations um, to get the angle right. The, um, choosing the wrong angle can have some effects in your predictions. So you have to be careful as to what angle for or, or geometry or aspect ratio all the elements is going to be. And once you have that, you can try different meshing and you can, you can see. And it, there is nothing better than once you have access to one of these tools, you take a number of benchmark exercises and you try to predict. I say, what happens here? What happens if I increase the width? My stiffness changes, my strength changes so much and so little. But the angle will give you a significant um, effect. So you better read the literature around this. And I think the uh, work of Lou and Panagiotto is excellent as give, uh, giving you the, 
um, recommendations for obtaining the aspect ratio of the elements. Now we can go crazy as a, as a researcher, maybe is uh, what well, today is not so important in, I let, me, let me rephrase that, in, in some parts of the world, there have been buildings, uh, I'm aware of, for example, in, in Colombia and in, in Peru of some works that are really thin and they could actually exhibit um, a plastic hinge instability, buckling of the, in, in the plastic hinge region. So there was a study, a, a PhD student of mine, Rodolfo Alvarez, who came up and extended the uh, beam truss model and he layered the web of the, of the elements. Now what we have, if we have a layer, with these, these elements can actually have um, um, nonlinear stress strain relationships for the concrete in those layers, in those fibers as well. Typically, you subdivide the, 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 the web of the element between six and eight. You can do some um, uh, panometric exercises and look what the effect of the number of uh, layers or fibers that you need in the transverse direction to capture well the out of plane behavior of a wall. So with that, um, let me give you one example here is of a building system analysis, the Alto Rio building in Chile. Um, this building, um, um, for some reason it didn't show two slides that I was going to show, Never mind. Uh, this is a 15, 15 story building that collapsed during the Maule earthquake uh, in 2010. It killed eight people. It's a um, dense array, has a dense array of walls in, of all kinds of geometries. Um, so what we did here, we took and modeled this building. Uh, let me see if I have the slides here for some reason. Oh. Are you there, uh, Massimo? Massimo, you have to unmute. You are muted. Okay. Okay, but we hear it. Very good. No, no, it's okay. I just had some slides here that were placed in the wrong place. So I was totally um, out of control when I saw that those slides. Yeah, I building 15 that. story. Okay, did, did you find them? Because I have them here. I think I have them here. Yeah, I did. I did. This, are you seeing my screen? I just got. Yes, we, we see the uh, Alto Rio building. Very okay. good. Thank you. I just got a message that Zoom quit unexpectedly, so I have no idea what happened. So yes. let's let's continue. This is a 15-story building, perhaps the first structural wall building that has ever collapsed because we thought that these buildings were pretty robust, but in Chile, with walls of about 200 millimeters and quite a high density of walls. In fact, this building came down, killed eight people and left quite a few people injured. So um, we look at this building and we model this building in Abacus using the models of uh, Danham and Rashid. Uh, and in parallel, we use the beam trust model as well. So you can see a rendering here of the building itself, uh, model, modeling rhinoceros. So the geometry was modeling rhinoceros. And then once we have the full geometry, we exported it and created the uh, beam trust model as well as the abacus model and run them to see differences between the two models. It's very interesting to see what the differences are. So you can see the high density of walls. And when you see these walls, you see oh, now we have all the, the alphabet of walls we can ever find. We have L shape, C shape, all kind of box shape, everything. We have curve walls. And this curve wall here 
we believe it was the culprit was why that in this direction when you, if you have bending towards up. sorry professor i think yeah. you are share, you are not sharing the presentation you are sharing the other screen because I'm, i i can see only the the slide alto rio building with the photograph let me probably you are sharing not the entire screen you're sharing just the powerpoint and no i i got something that that i got So when you go and share screen, soon, soon quit and expect a little. Something is going strange here. So let me let me do this. Okay. Okay. Now I can see the geometric modeling. This line. Okay. This is the geometric modeling rhinoceros that we we built and use for um, to model in Abacus with uh, shell elements uh, using um, um, Rashid and Dan Hamza. Uh, um, shell elements and constitutive stress strain materials, as well as the beam thrust model. Uh, this, in fact, this this geometry was completely uh, peer reviewed by the architect of the building, so we it's a high fidelity reproduction of the of the building itself. Everything is modeled here. So you see a cross, typical cross section. You can see. Can you see everything now? Yeah, now I see the, the cross section. Yeah. Perfect. So you can see here. It's a very oblong building, and you can see on on this side that it, there is very few walls, and only two walls we have here between 26 and 24, and these are curved and they are poorly detailed. We believe that an explosion took place in these walls here. And that triggered the collapse of the building that collapsed towards that side as well. But now what you see here is, it's a very complex um, array of geometries of walls. So it's, there is no such a thing as the, as the rectangular wall or the flange wall. It's, it's, it's all kind of walls that you have, little columns as well. And that's, that's welcome to the real world. And you can also see here some uh, corridors. This corridor in the upper floors will extend all the way here. So these, these walls disappear and will extend. So this, this corridor, the slab here over many, many stories is going to have a coupling effect between the different walls in the building. Yeah, um, use uh, uh, constitutive stress strain relationships for confined and unconfined concrete though you could barely find anything that is confined in this building. It's essentially unconfined. Uh, for reinforcing steel, we use um, Menegoto Pinto. We could have used um, um, a stress strain relationship I developed a few years ago, Restrepo. Um, but there is barely any, any uh, non-linearity in the reinforcing steel in this building. So it doesn't really matter what you're going to use. What is interesting in In, in, in these methods, and perhaps this is the main contribution we have done um, in the trust model, was to take the um, uh, coupling of the stress-strain relationship for concrete compression and the biaxial um, stresses, strains, demands or so, to couple it with the transverse strain. So the stress-strain relationship will depend on the strain that you have transverse to it. So we basically place um, a, gauge, uh, gauge link, a gauge element here, a, a strain gauge and monitor that transverse strain. And with that, we use the um, beta factor developed for the modified compression field theory by Becky and Collins and adapted it to this element. So it's essentially, it, it will degrade as you have more transverse strains, the, the strato, the diagonal compression field will degrade in strength until it basically crashes. And since we have, since we have a series of ugly uh, trusses, um, it looks ugly when you look at the individual trusses. So we basically put, um, Um, how can I say, a skin to the element. Let's say we, we put a skin and then we smear um, the um, strains in the element so we can plot them as heat maps or so, like in conventional shell elements or so. So at every node, we have three elements. We can, we can have a rosette 
And with that, we can um, take at every point or every element, we have an average uh, stress, um, uh, uh, strains in, 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 in the element. And with that, we can interpolate and give some uh, colors to the results. So here you see this, this building uh, today, even today, even though this work was done in 2014, um, this, this work still has the largest number of elements and is the largest finite element work that has ever been done on a building or so. I think our colleagues at the uh, Catholic University in Chile are working in Diana and doing some very interesting complex work as well. Uh, and that's pretty much what I think the state of the art is as far as modeling complex buildings or so. So the mesh size here is of the order of 500 millimeters. So we have 60,000 nodes, 360,000 degrees of freedom and 280,000 elements. Um, then we use um, a CPU in those days, probably the highest speed was, uh, um, I saw the order of three megahertz or so, and RAM was only 16 gigabytes and 18 processors to do this work, but it was done. So, and I can show you here some of the responses. And again, what I say here, you can um, check that is slightly stiffer the building when we compare with Abacus. Nothing significant, but we know ahead of time that the model is going to be um, stiffer. I think in Abacus we had 0 0.41 seconds. He, um, 40, 0.51 seconds, we have here 0 0.46 seconds. So, so it's slightly stiffer than the model in Abacus. Uh, most shapes are very similar uh, themselves. And we can see here the overturning moment in the y-axis and the displacement at one point in the roof because there is quite a bit of torsion in this building. So we just chose one corner and you can compare here the results from Abacus a little bit stronger than for this building with the, uh, here we have the work with the beam truss wall. So initially you can see again, here is just the differences here because of the initial stiffness or so. But then we see here, there is about 18% differences between Abacus and uh, the beam truss model. What, what we're looking here is not for accuracy. We don't have, for perfect accuracy, we don't have any benchmark or so there is nobody had done any work on this. This is the first building ever model this way. We had two models and we saw that from the engineering perspective, um, a difference between the two models of 18%, it's, um, it's not that very large. More important is to see that both models begin to soften at about a drift, roof drift ratio of 0.5%. So it takes very little lateral displacement in this building to begin softening. And what you see here, the beam trans model predicts as long as you have softening, you go down. Whereas um, in the abacus model, you have a very soft degradation. And that's perhaps what we need to focus. Which one of the two is perhaps more predicting better the failure? Is it, is it the beam trans model that shows that once you have here, you have complete loss of strength, it explodes, or you have a soft response. And I think, again, it's very difficult to say, you cannot have a crystal ball, but the fact that this building collapsed and there's parts of the elevator shaft that were not even seen, that they, they, they were little pieces that were completely um, made powder, uh, um, it seems that there was a very brittle failure that occurred in this building. Beyond that is no, nothing we can comment, but it's very interesting to observe results from the two models. Here you see some um, aspects on the pushover analysis. You can see apart from failure in the corner, um, when it crashes in both models, you can see some uh, degradation in shear. You can see some shear bands here. Again, this are now has been a smear with that skin I mentioned to you. And we have damage indices. 
where it shows you what's going on in this building. And you can see in this wall, you have a number of perforations, for example, a door openings at mono that are difficult to model, perhaps with uh, some macro elements. Um, then we have an accelerograph at about 1.2 kilometers away from, from the building itself. And we use that record, three components of, of the record for, for this building. We are aware in, in this basin there will be rotational ground motions and, the, and could affect the response of this building given the fact that this building is pretty slender, but there were no such motions available. Um, we use them, we corrected them with the GPS to have the low frequency as well. And these are the results of the nonlinear analysis. So this is pretty remarkable that we can do we can do this. We could not run the, the time histories with Abacus. With Abacus, we could only run the pushover analysis as well. So it gives you the versatility of, of the tool that we have uh, these days. Um, let, me, let me continue a little bit more here. Uh, here is uh, the roof and you can see the yield lines here um, the, the importance of the slabs and the, the fact that we had modeled these slabs with, um, with the beam trust model in a way that they were able to uh, develop the lines it shows that it had a significant coupling in this building. You can see the corridor here with the year lines in a building next door to it. This is, this is literally um, uh, 20 me uh, to 100 meters away from the building that collapsed. Now, let me give you an example of uh, component analysis with wall plastic hinge stability. So we are going to take this in even further and we're going to see that now we can layer, we layer the web of the walls, which has used the beam trust model, but we layer elements of well, fibers to capture the nonlinear response in the out of plane. And these are examples of um, wall tested by Joao Almeida in uh, Switzerland in 2017, where there was a, a plastic hinge instability. You see the base shear uh, top displacement in this wall. You see the hysteretic response is predicted rather well. And then you have, boom, you have the um, nonlinear response of the, um, in the out of plane with the collapse. So we can emulate that one here. You can see at some points, you see the uh, top in plane displacement and the out of plane displacement in the wall at this point. And you can see initially there is no out of plane displacement. This will, then there is little and all of a sudden, boom, it just goes out of plane. And this is a comparison of the strains. One of the things that you can do here uh, predicting a strain is really challenging with all methods. Um, and I think the method does, from what we have seen, a reasonable um, uh, uh, prediction of the strain distribution of profiles in structural walls. Um, here, of course, is even more complicated by the fact that we have uh, out of plane displacements um, and is eventually out. Um, instability in this region and then the wall is lost. Let me show you my final slide is the video of the response of this wall. And in the bottom one shows you that the, 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 the out of plane displacement and the lateral display are uncoupled initially and then it couples, you see. Now, by the gap, as the cracks begin to close that you have, it becomes unstable develops some um, out of plane displacements and until it becomes unstable. Yeah, you go. With this, I think I will conclude my presentation and I thank you all. Uh, thank you, Massimo. I don't know if, if we have questions or if we have the questions in September, maybe better or so. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for the nice presentation. I think that some, if someone has questions, they can do it even after I show the, the example, so they can okay. do some questions. But remember that in September we have a round table, so any complex question can be uh, can be done directly in September because we have a dedicated webinar on that.
So thank you again, Professor Rosé. Thank you for the thank next you. Time. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. That was from me. Okay, so uh, now we'll share my screen. Here we are, I'll move on this other computer. So um, uh, this one is the presentation of Professor Jose. Okay, so as I told you, um, Professor Restrepo has explained the theory of the uh, trust model as a first implementation and then the beam trust model as an extension to that. Um, now we, uh, we're basically, those tools are in OpenSys. Um, now I want to show you how you can model them in SDKO um, because they, as Professor said, they are efficient. Um, probably the only thing is that model, if, if someone wants to model this kind of assembly manually, can be quite complicated if you want to model trust by trust manually. So what we decided to do as a first attempt is to create an automation in SDKO. Um, so I was in contact with Dr. Um, Rodolfo Alvarez, who helped me to um, create this automation in SDKO. Basically, the idea was to let the user draw a simple surface. So it's like a shell modeling, um, just few material parameters. But then um, some other parameters like, uh, I will tell you later on, but basically the uh, regularization of the fracture energy for this kind of model. If you remember, I told you that every time you have softening, you have problem of strain localization. The solution becomes dependent on the mesh size, so you have to correct it. Um, of course, it should be done also in this model. And we decided to make it automatic. So I, I will explain you how it works. So basically what we did is an, is an automation that basically allows you to model this one as a surface, and then it gets translated into the trust model in OpenSeas. Um, for future work, we will do the same for the beam trust model, because now this one can only be used in two-dimensional environments, so probably for benchmark, for research, but if you want to put it inside a three-dimensional building, you have to wait for um, the implementation of this other model here. It will be done, I, I think, in the next version of STKO. Okay, so let's start soon. The, the model will be the same uh, the same model I told you last time, so it's the Mastianic shear wall. I, I will always be using the same one. Um, now we'll explain you how you can model this using the tool um, of the trust model. So the new tools that you have here, um, as I said the other time, you need uh, concrete models for, oh, by the way, let me show you a little bit the geometry. So we have uh, a face here in the middle for the web. Okay, which is basically the one that will be modeled with the, uh, with the cyclic trust model. Then we have the top beam and the bottom beam. We could have done a simple, uh, we could have made it simpler like fixing the bottom, but I decided to model the entire test here. So we have the bottom and top beam, they are elastic. And then we have the lateral uh, boundary elements. They are fiber elements, but in this case in two dimensional analysis, okay? Um, so you need, uh, plastic models for 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 uh, rebars. You can use Menegotto Pinto. In this case, I decided to use the esteretic material, but there are many of them. Then you you need to pick up a concrete model for concrete in the um, uh, for the columns. Okay, this one was the the one in tension. If you remember in compression, this was about this kind of behavior here. The new tools that you need now is this new con uh, concrete model, which is the concrete W beta. Uh, here, as usual, you have a link to the OpenSeas uh, material. So you have many information, but basically, despite of the fact that it has some new features uh, for the unloading, reloading rules, as Professor, um, Professor Estrepo said, it also includes the possibility to adapt to basically to scale the behavior according to the normal strain that you have if it is used uh, inside the beam trust model. Otherwise, it will behave as a standard concrete model, okay? So the meaning of the, all these parameters, you can see them in the OpenSeas documentation or you can go in the reference papers, okay? Um, here you may find an extra component that is not actually necessary for this material here, if it is used as a standard, uh, as a standalone 
concrete material, but it's useful if you use this material with the trust model automation that we have, because with this tool here, we can perform automatic regularization, okay? So basically this was, um, as Rodolfo told me, we need a characteristic size of the specimen used to obtain the stress strain curve. Um, I still have some doubt about uh, this thing here, but basically I calibrated now this length in such a way that I obtained the same fracture energy that we were using last time, okay? Uh, I will come back to this. As I told you, this one is a work in progress. I want to make this one automatic, um, but the, the idea is that basically the concept is the same. As you change the size of the mesh with respect to the, uh, the reference length, the behavior should be the same at the global level. To do so, what, should, what basically this equation that, that does is to basically change the ultimate strain in order to change the amount of dissipated energy, okay? So in such a way that at the global level, the amount of dissipated energy is pretty much the same. Okay, so you need basically, you need to define um, two concrete models, one for the vertical and horizontal uh, components, because if you remember, we have horizontal and vertical trusses and then the diagonal trusses for the shear behavior. Um, for vertical and horizontal, you need to define both the compressive stuff here and the, and the tension stuff, okay? So I calibrated us to match these other ones here on the concrete zero two. Um, for the uh, diagonal one instead, um, looking at the example the, the, I can find on OpenSys, basically there is no, almost no tension. Okay, now, not to put it to zero, it is put to a very small number, but basically if you do a cyclic test of this one, you will see that basically you have only compression. Uh, why? Because basically you have two trusses, okay? So one will work in compression on one side and one on the other side. Also here you have the same uh, characteristic length because it should be regularized. Okay, once you, once you define uh, these two concrete model, horizontal and vertical um, trusses and diagonal trusses, then you can pack them together into this tool here. This tool will basically contain all the information that we need to create the, beam tr the, the truss assembly out of this surface. So we need a tag of the material model for the vertical concrete, for the horizontal concrete, for the diagonal concrete, the thickness of the wall. Uh, I remind you that in this case, the wall has a, a 100 millimeter thickness. And then we need um, the material for the rebars. Okay, in this case is the uh, six diameter rebar here, which is this one. Then the diameter for the vertical direction, the spacing, for the vertical direction and same thing diameter for the horizontal direction and the spacing for the horizontal direction, okay? So this is pretty much everything to define the constitutive behavior of this automation. And then of course you need also the finite element uh, tool, okay? So the finite element property. So this one is the physical property and then you need the element property. The element property actually has very few parameters. You just need to, to, to choose if you want linear kinematics or rotational kinematics for the trusses, okay? Because actually, and behind the scene, it is using truss elements. So you can choose the same kinematics for the truss elements, okay? But in this case, we only want to consider linear kinematics. So everything else is exactly the same as the previous examples I gave for, um, for the shells, okay? So you have a fixity here at the base, according to the experiment, they were fixing both the base, to avoid the uplift, they were fixing also this tool, the stop place here. Then we have the self-weight for the web. Uh, it is a face force, uh, which is automatically lumped on the, uh, on the mesh nodes. Then we have the self-weight for the top and bottom beam. Then we have line forces for the boundary columns to simulate the self-weight of the columns. And then we have a prescribed displacement on this side here. As I told you, in this case, I'm going only to do a monotonic test for reasons of time, but I already set up another model for doing the cyclic test. Okay, so we don't need anything else. Oh, yes, uh, an equal dot. This is an extra thing I needed. Why? Well, basically because the um, this element here, if I select, okay, so the element inside this space, 
are actually part of this geometry, which is made of surfaces. Uh, this is fine because they have two dimension and two degrees of freedom in open seas, okay? But then I wanted to put also beams as the boundary elements. Now beams in two dimensional analysis, they have three degrees of freedom. And in open seas, you cannot combine at the same node elements which have different degrees of freedom. So you need to, to draw them as separate geometries. Like this one here is the geometry for uh, the truss model and the bottom and top faces. And then you have two lines, one on this side and one on the other, which are basically the beams. So basically then I created an interaction, a node-to-node um, node interaction here. Let me edit it. A simple node-to-node link, which couples the beam to the, um, to the wall inside. And to this interaction, I assign a simple equal dot only in the two displacement degrees of freedom. So the rotation is uncoupled, but the two displacement are coupled with the displacement of, uh, of the truss model. Uh, this is the typical way you have in open seas whenever you want to join an object which has more degrees of freedom than another one. So this one is the only difference. All the other boundary conditions are the same you have seen in the other, in the other models. As usual, we start with a recorder. I call this one a uh, cyclic truss model, regular, because it, as Professor uh, Oser Estrepo told us, it is very important to calibrate the, um, the angle. So the aspect ratio of the mesh will be important. In fact, now we'll start with the regular one, and then I will show you what happens if you don't pay attention to that and you use a very irregular mesh. And I'm using so a regular mesh, so perfectly square element. Uh, with a spacing equal, well, approximately equal to the spacing of the rebars, okay? And then I want to record just the displacement. Well, I need also reaction forces. And to see what's going on inside the trusses, I also want material stress and material strain. Okay, uh, I think I have something else here. Oh, but this one is not necessary. Perfect. Okay, then after the recorder, as usual, you need boundary condition. Here we have only one fixity for the base as a single point of strain. And then we have one multi-point of strain, which is the equal dot to couple the boundary beams um, to the web. Then we apply a load pattern for the gravity load with a linear time series. And we have all the loads here that we applied on the structure, okay? Then we do, we do a simple gravity analysis, duration of one, just one increment because we do not expect no linearity here. Then never forget to keep the load constant and reset the pseudo time step to zero because I've seen uh, people commit doing this error over and over again. After that, you apply the lateral load. Now in this example, for reasons of time, I will use uh, the linear time series to do a simple pushover analysis with an imposed displacement, okay, which is this push load here which is applied, I remind you, here at this point. If you don't want to do that, there is also, uh, if, you, if you want to play with it, um, when you will be able to download the file, here you also have the cyclic uh, load protocol taken from, uh, from the paper. So you can simply switch the, the time series and perform a cyclic test. Um, after we apply the push load, I define a monitor because I want to monitor what's going on in real time. So for the X axis, I want to monitor the X displacement at the control node, which is basically uh, the same node where I apply the displacement. Um, and then in the Y axis, I want to monitor the reaction forces um, at the control node, because actually I'm applying that displacement. So here the reaction is actually equal to the, to the force. Otherwise you can choose uh, the reaction set, but then you have to change the sign uh, of, the, of the load. Since I'm working in Newton, I want to see the, the results in kilonewtons. So I have a scale factor of one over 1000. And then, as you know, in the monitor, you can plot your result against a, bed, a background plot, okay, which in this case would be um, will be what you will find here, the reference curve, okay? So I simply put this one inside the monitor. And finally, a displacement control analysis. Once again, I remind you that 
In this specific case, I only have one point of application of the load. So instead of applying a load and doing a displacement control analysis, I decided to apply an imposed displacement and do a load controlled analysis, which is the same thing um, if you want to apply only the load only at one point. It is different if you have a building, okay? So if you want to do a pushover analysis at different building, it's not the same thing of applying a load or applying a displacement. But for this behavior here, it is, it is the same thing. So load control, one second of duration. The duration is not important because it is static. Uh, adaptive time step, because we may experience non-linearity, uh, non-convergence issues. So um, this tool will, will try to adapt the time step to uh, try to, meet, to, meet, to match the convergence, okay? Uh, here you have the typical parameters for the adaptive time stepping. Okay, so, uh, oh yes, the mesh. Okay, so in this case, I was using a regular mesh with a global seed equal to uh, 180, okay? You can see it is the same here. I will start with this one, which is the optimal mesh. Then I will show you that if you don't pay attention to this, because actually you may see this one in the, uh, the preprocessor as a shell element. So you may think that the element can be distorted, can be whatever shape you want. Instead, it is very important that the elements are, uh, first of all, they should be aligned with the global axis. Because remember that, uh, let me show you the, the global axis here. Remember that behind the scenes, what we do is to draw uh, for each quad element. Actually, I can do a drawing here. Um, well, I don't have the, the tool, but basically for each quad element here, Behind the scene, we create um, four truss models, actually more than four because we have a truss model for concrete, a truss model for, for steel and so on, and then the diagonal trusses, okay? Now, if the element is distorted, the diagonal trusses will be distorted as well, but also the, the horizontal and, and um, vertical trusses. So we have a tool, in this tool, basically we raise an error, we give an error if the element is distorted. So try to keep it, uh, as horizontal and vertical as possible. Instead, for the aspect ratio, we didn't put any limit because as Professor has said, you have to calibrate the inclination of, of, the, of the diagonal trusses. Um, so in this case, I will start with a perfectly square uh, mesh. Okay, so the inclination is 45 degrees. Um, here we have another one, okay? So I can start with this analysis and then I will show you what happens with uh, with others here i had another analysis running i can close it okay so once you're done with this oh by the way in this case since the elements are very few i'm using uh, standard uh, sequential analysis okay so you have to pick open seas for this analysis and let's run it okay so you have the standard open seas tool here and you have the monitor Okay, now while we wait for this analysis to finish, I want to show you what the automation is actually doing. Because here you see it looks like shell element, but actually it is not. So if you go inside, um, inside the folder, <coughs> which is here, and you open the elements equal, well, here you have the elements generated for um, the bottom and top beam, but then you have the elements for the trust model. As you can see, every quad element, for example, the quad element number 207 in STKO has actually generated a bunch of trust elements, okay? So you have bottom concrete, which is the concrete going from node one to node two, okay? Which has uh, this connectivity and this area and this material model, which is a material model which has been duplicated here. So basically it took the parameter you define in the prototype model, I change it to calibrate the ultimate strain intention and compression to basically perform this uh, fracture energy regularization. So that's why basically you need one material for potentially one new material for each new, uh, each new element. Okay, so in fact, you can see here uh, a new concrete model for this assembly, for the vertical concrete, for the horizontal concrete, and for the diagonal concrete, okay? And then you see the assembly of trusses, bottom concrete, top concrete, left and right concrete, and then you have bottom steel, top steel, left steel, right steel, and then the diagonal concrete, okay? 
here when you look at the uh, the values they should be the area of the of the reinforcement in this case in this case they match almost exactly the size of the, the size of the reinforcement because i made a mesh which has the same size as the um, as the spacing of the reinforcement okay but of course if you make if you make an element smaller here you will see a smaller area because it's like spreading the reinforcement all around okay and then the same assembly for the next element and so on okay so while you're uh, looking at this one as a simple modeling in stko where basically you define two prototype concrete model you assemble all of them together and you simply define one finite element on a shell behind the scene it is translating it to the um, trust model assembly okay okay let's go here the analysis is already finished just a couple of minutes okay so let's try to go and see the results so first of all you can see that the prediction is pretty uh it's pretty nice here for oh but by the way for example now i accidentally closed the uh the monitor if you don't know you can relaunch the monitor like this okay so that there is a file there called launch monitor and you can relaunch it um as professor said probably at the beginning you have an overestimation of the initial stiffness but as you go into the nonlinear behavior everything matches much better and then you see a failure, shear failure here, where you have progressive failure at the beginning, then we will compare it with the results. Then you have the final failure at this point. Now, if we go in post-processing, the post-processing is something on which we have to work a little bit more because now when you open it from OpenSeas, you go here and you open the regular, is this one, okay? you still see now the, um, you don't see them as a shell, you see them as trusses. Um, so what I'm planning to do instead is to visualize them as a shell also in the post-processor. As professor said, it is much easier to post-process the result. In fact, here, if I click on this element, I actually see that I have four elements, okay? One concrete and one B, one steel from one side and one concrete and one steel from the other side. So doing post-processing, if you want to go and see the strain is a little bit complex, but for example, if you want to visualize the adjusted displacement contour, it's pretty fine. You can see here the, uh, the final diagonal crack. So it starts here with the first nonlinearities. There are some inclined crack here, which are not easily visible now. The final crack is easily visible with the displacement because you see the displacement jump. If you want to see them uh, in a different way, you can visualize the strain in the elements, okay? Now, they are axial strains, so they have different inclinations based on the, uh, on the truss, but they can give you an idea of the location of the cracks. So you can create another plot group. You can create a Gauss point plot, because remember, we have trusses, so we can see the result of the Gauss points, which are located in the middle. Uh, we can choose material strain and we can increase the particle size a little bit, okay? So now basically they are, they are showing the strain in each truss. Uh, of course, the strain will be larger uh, in the position of the crack, okay? So you can use it as a tool to understand where the crack is forming, okay? So here the deformation is pretty uniform at the beginning. Then you see a first crack here as the the uh, as the wall starts bending, okay? Then you see some diagonal cracks here starting from the middle. And at the end, you see the final diagonal crack, okay? Uh, which is pretty much what we have seen in uh, what we see here. So you start with these diagonal cracks <coughs> starting from the middle. And then finally you reach um, diagonal cracks that leads to the final collapse uh, of the wall, okay? So this, the prediction is pretty fine. Uh, as professor said, you have to pay attention to the size of this. Now, I'm not super expert of this model because I still need to work on it to create some automation, but I did some tests um, changing the aspect ratio. And in fact, you have to pay attention to this. Uh, in this case, you have a nice diagonal track here, but then I did a test. Okay, what happens if I, for example, 
I close this one, I save it. Uh, what happens if I make a distort mesh? Okay, like for example, I distort the mesh, I change the aspect ratio either in the horizontal direction or in the vertical direction. I just want to understand how it works. So I started playing with it. Uh, okay, so in the vertical direction, pay attention to do this uh, because otherwise you will not have a, a, a very good prediction. Okay, so try to keep the, um, to look on the, at the paper, how to calibrate the inclination angle. Um, for example, if you look at the results, um, where is it? Uh, distorted one. Okay, so in this case, I was seeing a diagonal track, which was slightly more spread. Um, if I look at the Gauss plot, and I increase the particle size and also the deformation. Okay, see uh, uh, the, the, the cracks are now starting here, then bending in a, in a direction, which is the direction that I have from the mesh. Okay, so that's why probably it's important to have uh, a proper mesh orientation. Okay. Um, if I did it on the other side, it was even worse because I was promoting the crack instead at the bottom. Okay. So if I open the distorted two, I think, yes. Uh, now here you cannot see it so much because actually it is a sliding at the bottom. But if I do a Gauss point plot, um, you see here you have major sliding. So you have to pay attention to this. Uh, I still need to study how it works. So I was just playing with it. Uh, but for sure, the inclination is very important here. Um, then something else that I try to do if you want to play with it, or something actually that I've seen in the continuum models, and I wanted to see if it, if it was a mistake of the continuous models or if it was physical. I did something, and this will be actually the starting point of the discussion of September. One problem that you have, that you will have always when you have strain softening, is the size effect. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you have softening, um, the size of the microstructure is very important, okay? So in this case, the microstructure can have a typical size, which is the spacing of the rebars, because actually they determine the spacing between the, the cracks, okay? So what happens if you do a mesh which is much finer than the spacing of the rebars? I wanted to understand what's going on. So basically I've seen that uh, if I do this with the continuum models, okay? So for example, I started with a, uh, with a smear shell, okay? With a coarse mesh. This one was the uh, deformation, the final crack that I was obtaining with, um, with the shell. So it was a little bit inclined, but it looked like pretty much diagonal. Okay, so and this one was the initial model, so the spread, the, the smear uh, rebars. I said, okay, now I try to refine the mesh. I want to see if I obtain the same results or if it goes to another result, it tends to another result. And I was obtaining something like this. So that's why I, I will explain it to you this one in the final, um, in the final uh, day of the 8th of September, but basically, you have to pay attention to the dimension of the mesh in these cases, okay? Now, when I was doing a finer mesh, this is what I was obtaining. Uh, the, the, the overall displacement curve was fine, but the location of the crack was not so good, okay? So as you can see here, I was having the first, the first crack that was developing here was developing actually too fast before the diagonal crack could appear. So another minor crack appeared up here with a, a curved trajectory, but actually the main failure was basically the sliding of this one. So I, at the beginning, I thought it was a mistake, but actually uh, it makes sense because then I did it with every kind of model. So this one, then I did it with, uh, with the uh, embed approach where the, basically the, the rebars are not located into the concrete, but are smeared 
It is slightly better, but it has the same trend. So if I have the, the, um, the coarse mesh, it is pretty much diagonal because the size of my mesh is similar to the, to the mesh, to the physical size of the material model. Then if I refine the mesh and it was the embedded standard, but refined, I see the same behavior. So I go to the strain, uh, principle max, Okay, so I see some first diagonal cracks here, but they develop too fast. And then another diagonal crack develops from here. So I was trying to understand what was going on. Uh, but basically I've seen pretty much the same thing. If I, if I refine too much the mesh also with the, the truss model, it is, a little, it is much better because the truss model predicts the diagonal crack, but I've seen the same trend. So it was actually fine because it was meaning that all the elements were converging to the same solution. So I wanted to understand uh, what was going on, probably something that was missing um, here. And no, I want to show the Gauss plot. Oh, this one, uh, it is already here. It is in the CTM and you can use the CTM fine, but it should be running parallel, okay? Because there are many elements here. Um, so if I put 10 here and I want to see a major, okay, major cracks are developing here and then there are other cracks here. So if I put 30, you can see other cracks developing here. So the trend is the same. This primary crack was developing too fast before the diagonal crack was forming. Um, now I wanted to understand why it was happening. Um, and then actually one thing is that uh, whenever you do analysis of strain softening materials, you have to pay attention, well, to the size of the mesh, as Professor said, but also to the uh, orientation, but also to the size, because it's true that we do uh, fracture energy regularization, either in the beam trust model or also in the continuum models. But the only thing that you regularize is the amount of dissipated energy. The problem is that the finer is the mesh, the more uniform, is the material that you are trying to simulate, okay? So the crack will develop much faster. And in this case, basically the first crack that appears, okay, which in the coarse mesh was stopping and was allowing the diagonal crack to form, is actually now forming much faster. And it promotes a sliding at the base rather than, uh, rather than a diagonal crack. So that, way, that can be one problem. So another thing that you may take into account is that when you have strain softening, do not rely on the concept that I can refine the mesh, I will converge to a good solution because this is not necessarily true. But this was this will be a starting point of the discussion for for the next um, for the next webinar. Actually, not the next webinar. In the next webinar we will be talking about the multiple vertical line element. But for the final uh, round table, okay, and probably probably the, another issue can be that. I completely attach the web to the to the boundary beams, and probably the boundary beams are uh, are kind of pushing and pulling the web here. While in reality, there is a uh, there is some sort of cracking uh, between the two that basically allow the arch effect. So there are many things that we can talk about. Um, so it can be a starting point also for some suggestion from Professor Restrepo about how to attach the beam to this model here. Um, so yes, uh, for today is everything. I want to show you basically what you will got in this folder. You will have the CTM regular, which is the, the good one, the good model. Then two uh, tests of um, a distorted mesh, which is something that you should avoid. As professor said, take the reference, look at how the um, angle should be calibrated. Then you have the uh, fine mesh, which should be run with parallel analysis, just to see how the solution change when the mesh gets finer. And then you have the same one, which is this one, the standard with 180 millimeters mesh, but with the cyclic setup, okay? So you can see how it performs in, uh, in cyclic behavior. And yes, that's all. And uh, if you have any questions, please, we have 
let's say other 10 minutes for short questions and all the major questions instead will be postponed to the 8th of September. So once again, thank you very much and thank you to Professor Restrepo. And please, if you have questions. Massimo, there are some questions in the... Oh yeah, there are questions here. here. Okay. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah. Oh, hi, Duchenko. Um, so could you please show experimental and calculated load displacement curves together? Um, are you talking about this one? So let me go back here. For some reason, I don't see the windows. Just give me a second. Okay, here. Talking about this one, this one basically, yes, yeah, the experimental cyclic response, yeah. And this one is the um, is the predicted response in mono in monotonic test. Uh, could you show please the maximum principal strain? No, uh, actually, because this one is a uh, is the same reason why Professor uh, Osere Strepo told that they develop a scheme like shell element to post processing it, which is something that we need to we need to do because now in post processing you will see the trusses. So you basically can see only the scalar strains for each truss. But basically, if you look them at the diagonal truss, there will be strains in the diagonal direction. If you look them on the horizontal trusses, they will be strain in the horizontal direction. But you cannot see a principal strain because actually what I need to do is to create a post-processing tool that creates this scheme that basically was has been shown by Professor Estepo. They takes these strains from these assembly of trusses and show them to you as a continuous strain of a, of a shell element, okay? But the tool is here, so you can start playing with it. Our plan is to basically extend this automation to the beam truss element and to the post-processing of them. In such a way that also in post-processing, you can see them as, as shell element, which will be much easier for, for post-processing, okay? Um, Okay, I don't think we have other question here okay. in the chat. Maybe also if there are, uh, Professor Restrepo is still here, so if there are questions also for Professor Restrepo. Uh, yes, yes, here. of course, Professor Restrepo is still here, so if you have questions. Uh, there is one question from Lean. Do trust model can only model in plane behavior and beam trust model can model both in plane and out of plane behavior? Okay, Professor Restrepo, if you want, you can answer. But I think you already, yeah, you already give an introduction on this. Lin is actually our student here. So yes, uh, Lin, it's, uh, that's correct. Uh, the, with the trans model is specifically done for in-plane and the beam trans model is, is being um, tailored more to have more like um, a shell element so, so. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Is there any other question? We have other five minutes. Just one, one thing, um, uh, Massimo, Rodolfo, we have several types of rosettes. I just show you one. Yeah. Um, but Rodolfo has implemented in his PhDs several others. We compare, we compare uh, different ways of defining the rosettes. And of course, there are some differences, but overall they they should be uh, pretty similar. And okay. I think you can contact Rodolfo exactly. for exactly what I want to do is to contact Rodolfo and come back on the development of these automations. And actually, there was one thing I wanted to ask you because when I've seen the, those uh, presentation, I've seen that you have this skin for post processing, but I did not understand if it is a skin like. Uh, the element is still the assembly of beam and trusses, but then the way you post-process them, you post-process them as a shell, or you implement no. a shell element, which inside actually has the 
uh, as a reference on the beam and trust element, because actually I would like to do the same in open. Now you're, you're going to get me into the computer science aspects of it, which I probably are pretty literate. Oh, okay, um, okay. I, I, as, a, as an experimentalist, I told him, look, I have, I have a, a rosette at every point that I want to have, and then you can interpolate. And beyond that, how do they do the interpolation? And I know Rodolfo may have programmed that in C or C plus, and Peju oh, okay. Shane may have programmed that in MATLAB, all the interpolations. So I don't have any detail. Um, oh, okay. All I know is that I, I have several, I, I can do the rosette and then do some kind of interpolation or so, which probably you understand what I mean, but I okay. cannot implement it myself. Okay, okay, okay. So H, anyway. H comes with uh, problems. Okay, and okay, so but basically the idea is that it, also you think that adding the post processor that shows you a shell like element seems easier for post processing rather than visualizing directly the, 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 the trusses. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely, the trusses are ugly, and you want to show heat maps, the so called um, um, continuum colors, or so. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, that's why the media was to also create this tool in SDGO so that it's easier to visualize. Also yeah, to when, when, Mario's, when Mario's develop what is in open seas with the trusses or so, uh, I just personally, I'm, I'm a visual person, I say that looks ugly and it does the work, but I think for the uh, general audience or so, it's much better to see continuum changes in colors or so, to see more of an interpolated field. Okay. And okay, on the other side, just one, one question I, I had for you, because I, I was doing this test on the mesh, um, on the distortion, and I've seen that I had these different results, and then you confirm that it is very important to check the the inclination of the of the strut. So, is this the same reason we obtained uh, different results? Yeah. At the distorted mesh, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. There is the user has to be first of all half in hand, maybe a um, a linear uh, finite element solution or so, and choose the right angles. You, once you choose the right angles, you can play with them a little bit, but if you exaggerate the aspect ratios, it is quite sensitive. And this is this is where you see that no element is, uh, is going to solve all your headaches. You, you just this is for sure. Mm -hmm. This actually will be the starting point for um, the, the, the final web, the final web in September. One thing that I always say is that whenever you try to model strength softening in general, not only in uh, reinforced concrete, you don't have to think that it's like in linear analysis that you pick an element, you run the analysis and you can rely on the result. Uh, there is not a unique solution because actually strain softening is something that cannot be modeled in, in finite element. Uh, we do it because we need to do it, but we have to do it carefully. That's why we decided to do this tool, this course where basically we can explore all the tools that we have in OpenSeas so that people can choose what is the, the best one for each situation. So yes, right. as, as an experimentalist, most of my life, which I'm switching these days to analysis, um, I can tell you the only true answer is the test. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I actually have, have a question too for Professor Strip with a, just a curiosity. Did, did, did you compare the demand with the capacity at the end of the Rialto, like with the pushover, the DRS, for example? Like demand the internal spectra with the pushover, or I you ask me a question that 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 gives me a um, an interesting answer. I back in the nineties, together with Sashi Kunat at Buffalo, we were pioneers of the pushover, not linear pushover analysis, and adaptive pushover analysis, and and for some reason it became very popular. But I. I believe the pushover analysis is good only for testing your model. I will not draw, particularly for complex buildings, I will not draw um, conclusions based on a pushover analysis. The higher modes of response, torsion, all kinds of combination you see in a building like this have a huge influence that you can just kind of capture with a pushover. If you look at the a linear analysis for this building or so, um, the first model may be carrying, in, in one direction, may be carrying 50% of the mass. 
uh, so 55% or so, and, and you're trying to reach a conclusion with a pushover. I, and unfortunately, it has become too popular to, for this. I will just use a pushover as an intermediate step to, um, in preparation for the nonlinear analysis, but I will not use it as a, I will use it as a part of the calibration process that when you're developing an analysis, but I will not necessarily use it to draw conclusions. We don't know what the capacity of the building was. Uh, nobody knows. There were some lab splices that never worked. Uh, we did sensitivity analysis on that um, without the, without, with bars that were uh, fully spliced and with bars that had a poor splice, they have a small effect on the overall behavior. But that's as much as we can see. Uh, it's it's impossible to see exactly what happened in the building. We can, I think we, the conclusion we reached with, with the pushover analysis is, is that the building is very brittle. It just takes no lateral displacement when it begins to soften. That's a major conclusion. Um, which is very unfortunate for the for the people who who died or uh, was affected, and it was in good faith in Chile that they uh, preclude the use of um, of boundary elements in the walls for ductility because they thought genuinely they thought that the the earthquakes in Chile were all high frequency um, um, ground motions and in Concepcion they had a very strong basin effect and this building was. The initial period of the building was was shorter than the major amplification of the ground motion. So as the building cracks and moves toward the non-linear cracks and eventually yields, it just moves to the higher um, where the energy of the ground motion is, and it really smacked that building. And it it did many other buildings. This one unfortunately collapsed, but many many buildings in around that part of the city were eventually demolished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like also from our uh, analysis pushover, even when they are regular, the buildings, they are not predicting good results because the irregularity is in, no, in the non-linearity behavior. So it's only I mean, in Europe, areas. unfortunately, we work a lot with pushover and this. Yeah, especially in Europe, it became yeah, very exactly. popular. And I, I have no idea why was that. In fact, if you look at the uh, the PhD work of Iman Sadjarno, which I did with Atur Car. Uh, we co supervised when I was in New Zealand. In the end, the, the analysis he did uh, compared to ground motions and the pushover, they have no very little correlation. So we, I, we pretty much abandoned the use of pushover analysis as a, as a tool that you use to draw conclusions. I still use it for calibration purposes. Yes. Oh, I completely agree with you. Absolutely. Unfortunately, in Europe, <laughs> this is a problem right yeah. now. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question, Professor Restrepo. Yes. Um, Who so, is the um, so just now, uh, um, Mr. Mo showed us the, you know, the mesh size influence on the shell model and also trust model. And uh, just now you answered about uh, your trust model, the angle, the uh, effects is very uh, sensitive. From, from my understanding as a user, so uh, regardless what I use show model or trust model, um, as you can see, a uh, mesh size is very, um, like, is very sensitive uh, to the results. So um, how I'm gonna to choose the mesh size carefully? And uh, so that is, uh, or I just uh, choose, choose different mesh size, see which, which mesh size is no. has the best match with the experiment experimental results, or do you have any other suggestions? Uh, Lou and Panagiotto in their in the report, they have give you recommendations for the for the angle. And there is those recommendations are actually based on, on theory. They are not um, randomly chosen or so. I see. Um uh, another request can when, you just when I did when I did the very initial work um, with Marios back in 2008 or so, we did not have the formulation. So we were working like, what is the best mesh aspect ratio to predict the, the, um, the response, but that's not engineering. That, that's a little bit of um, guessing work. So that's no prediction, that's post 
Dixion. So we wrote the paper on the basis of what are the measures we need to get the best thing. But in reality, as an engineer, you want to do the inverse problem is how I'm going to do a blind prediction of this. What do I need to do? And then Marius went, uh, work, went further from the work we did together here. And he basically um, uh, worked and made the recommendations for them. Okay. Um, another request, can you uh, share this reference to us so that we can uh, look carefully? Uh, reference? Uh, just now Should... you mentioned. The... Yeah, let me, let me, let me, if you keep talking, I, I'll find the reference by put it on the chat window and Massimo can do that. So it's in, it's an, um, it's a Berkeley report, EERC report, but while you ask some other questions, I can look for it. Okay. Uh, In the meantime, if you have other questions, please. Oh, maybe we should we should mention the fact that we are going to anticipate the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, tomorrow we are going to have uh, the fourth day of webinar regarding the multiple vertical line element. There will be also Professor Kolotsvari, which developed that tool. Uh, and it did, this will be tomorrow at the same time, so 6 p.m. Now, um, for the 8th of September, we have the latest, the last, um, the last meeting, which is uh, a round table and question and answers. Um, we want uh, all to be there, especially now we want also Professor Restrepo to be there. So uh, since he, had, he has a meeting, some other things to do, basically we decided to anticipate it of one hour. So it will be at, well, we will send a reminder, but it will be at 5 p.m. Italian time, okay? So it will be just, it will be just anticipated by one hour, okay? Okay, here we have in the chat, all you have the link by Professor Restrepo. Lin? Yes. It's for you is like $15. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I. I I tried my best to model this wall. Yeah. Very good. I'm going to download it and give it to you to, for $10, Lynn. Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, but it's on, only for Lynn because he, Lynn is going to be very rich in five years. <laughs> okay. So good to know. We are going to. <laughs> you yeah, will see. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Restrepo. You're most welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Okay, so I think we are done. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jose Restrepo. And I hope to see you again in, uh, in September, in the 8th of September, for the final uh, discussion. Okay, so for everybody else, see you tomorrow. Okay, don't forget there is the webinar about multiple vertical line elements. Okay, so thank Bye you, everyone, all. for the participation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor.